<clears throat> so, good morning, everybody. Um, lovely to see you on this festival day, uh, albeit an online festival. Um, so, today we're celebrating the enlightenment of the Buddha about two and a half thousand years ago. And Buddhist tradition has it that um, the Dharma died out for a very, very long period, um, possibly even eons, and it needed a Buddha to turn up and become enlightened primarily through his own efforts to enable the path to Buddha, the path to enlightenment to come available once more to people like us. And um, yeah, so without that historic event two and a half thousand years ago, we wouldn't be here today uh, doing what we're doing. So we might even regard this as, uh, maybe as Buddhist, as possibly the most momentous historic um, event of all. Just putting that forward as uh, poss possibly my point of view anyway. Um, so to, as part of the celebration today, we're going to be looking at the verses which um, Vidya Saki read earlier on in the, in the meditation period. Um, and I'll now read them again. This is um, from chapter 14 of the Dharmapada as translated by Bhante Sangrachita. And these are the verses which I'll be focusing on um, for my, my talk and our reflection um, a bit later on in this period. So this is Bhante's translation. That enlightened one whose sphere is endless, whose victory is irreversible, and after whose victory no defilements remain to be conquered. By what track will you lead him astray, the trackless one? That enlightened one, in whom there is not that ensnaring, entangling craving to lead anywhere in conditioned existence, and whose sphere is endless. By what track will you lead him astray, the trackless one? So I'll be, for, be, be referring bit by bit to some of the different lines in those verses as, as, as I continue. So I'll just tell you what, what, um, what we'll be doing in, in this period. Um, so I'll start off saying a bit about the imagination, because we're dealing with some quite mysterious verses here, which have a sort of a, a gloss of, of rationale to them, but, that the, the, but the, we're not going to fully get uh, what's actually being pointed at through just the, um, the intellect. So we're going to need to engage the imagination. So I'll be saying a bit about the imagination to start off with and how it might help us to penetrate the significance and meaning of these, these profound verses from way back in the earliest days of the Buddhist tradition. And then I'll suggest some possible intellectual understandings just to give us a bit of a handle on what they might be pointing at. But I, what I say will not exhaust the meaning. I'm not really telling you what the verses mean, just giving you uh, a possible doorway into them. And um, hopefully you'll become a bit more engaged with the, with the verses as a result. Um, then I'll say a bit about um, a, a term which I'll be using every now and again, and that's coming into relationship with or um, relating to the Buddha. So I'll be finishing off my talk with some suggestions about what that might look like, look like in practice, this coming into a deeper relationship with, with enlightenment or the Buddha. And then after a Q&A section, um, so we'll be, we'll be inviting people to um, put some questions in the chat, and then we'll have a short period of Q&A before I lead us in a reflection period, where we'll just be um, lightly and loosely taking um, some of the verses into our minds and reflecting on them, ultimately, hopefully in some sort of imaginative way, which will help us to come into a deeper contact um, with the Buddha and with enlightenment. So that's a bit of a plan as what we will be doing in this, in this period. Um, but first of all, I wanted to say a little bit about 
the lack of the Buddha on the shrine, which was um, which was Vidya Saki's inspiration. And when she suggested it, I thought, well that, well, that works rather well with what we're trying to do today in terms of trying to invite the emotion, invite the imagination rather, to have um, a more telling response to the Buddha, to enlightenment. So with, with no um, figure here to, to look at, maybe it invites uh, a more creative response from our imagination. And I remember hearing um, Sabuti talk some while back, and he was at um, Bodh Gaya, and where he was at that time, there, there was no uh, figure of the Buddha, um, there was no representation of the Buddha. And he said something which really resonated with me, was that if there's, if there's nothing to look at, um, you can quite strongly get a sense of the absence of the figure. And this sense of absence can be a really good doorway in get in, into getting a sense of presence. So if one is noticing a lack of, um, of the Buddha, if you like, um, in a way you're, you're already starting to come into a relationship with him. So I rather like the idea of absence as a doorway into getting a stronger sense of the presence of the figure. And um, in my experience, this can, this can even lead to a sense of longing for the presence of the Buddha, which is um, one way of, uh, uh, one could say, of coming into a more deeper relationship with the Buddha figure. Now, the verses we're going to be looking at um, are quite metaphorical, as I suggested a bit earlier. They can't be fully understood at the level of the intellect. And we may, maybe could go a bit further and say, we, do, we just can't get our heads around the Buddha. He's just a bit too mysterious for us, really. But, that is, but that in a way, that is not a big problem because the imagination can help us here. It's through the imagination that we get a, um, a, a, a proper doorway into, um, into, into enlightenment and in the Buddha. So we might uh, do that through um, a visualization of, of the Buddha figure, um, through a sadhana, through a visualization, or through an image or metaphor. And the, the verses we'll be looking at today, that they're, they're quite metaphorical. So the, the title for the day is Tracing the Trackless One. So even talking about trackless, that's really metaphorical. And you can maybe we'll get some sort of hands on what that might mean. But ultimately, it's, it's something of a, of a metaphor, so something which the imagination can start to get hold of and help us to come into deeper relationship with the Buddha. And um, the same rapture as Bhante has said in the past that he see, sees a symbol or a metaphor as being possibly a better doorway into reality um, than just sort of uh, intellectual thinking about um, ideas. So, so met metaphors and symbols can be a really good doorway into reality, and hence coming into relationship with the Buddha. So it's as if symbols and metaphors are a bit more open-ended than just um, plain intellectual ideas, which we, which we can kind of get our head around. Now, when I'm going to be talking about imagination here, um, I'm not just talking about um, fantasy or imaginative images or poetic phrases um, coming into our mind. I'm also talking more broadly about um, the creative potential of the mind, which might be expressed as experiences, um, even experiences uh, uh, with a dimension of insight through in positive emotions and, and um, other states of mind. <clears throat> so we can look on all these as different ways in which the creative potential of the mind expresses itself. And we might use the imagination as, a, as an umbrella term for that. So one thing to say about the imagination is that it's at its most effective when both the emotions and the intellects are engaged. This is something which Sabuti and Bhante have stressed in the past. And um, in the current context of looking at verses from the Dharmapada, 
what this um, might mean is that as well as starting to get a bit of an intellectual handle, getting an idea of what the verses are pointing at, we also come in uh, come into contact with any emotional responses we have to the verses we're reflecting on. And this may, this may be uh, uh, very little or it may be quite substantial, but either way, it's uh, for the imagination to become most alive, we're actually in touch with any emotional responses we have to what we're reflecting on. So when we um, come to do some uh, reflection later on, I'll be inviting us to do some uh, discursive reflection and also coming in, just noticing any emotional response we have to what we're reflecting on. And then finally, we, we were inviting a deeper dive, um, which is not going to be really a discursive treatment of the, of the verses. It's going to be more like just staying with and inviting uh, some sort of response from our depths through the imagination. And having had the um, intellect engaged to some degree and also our emotional life, that's going to be a good, a good feed into our, any emotional or rather any imaginative response we may have to the verses to go as far as we can uh, with our imaginative response to the verses. And we might even, might even go so far as to say that um, once we get to this stage, we, we could describe it as, a, as, a, as um, the meditation stage of the listening, reflecting, meditating triad. Um, we, we, one waits patiently to see the Dharma, to see the Dharma more clearly, and hence to see the Buddha. And something I wanted to say about um, how, how might we come into um, a more profound relationship to the Buddha. And this is through the Dharma. And there, there are verses from the Diamond Sutra, uh, which says something to the effect of those by my form did see me, and those who followed me by voice, wrong the efforts they were engaged in, me those people will not see. From the Dharma should one see the Buddhas. So what this seems to suggest to me is that um, via the Dharma, having a real engagement with the Dharma, whether that's through meditation, whether it's through reflection, or even through ethical practice and, and friendship, it's through this deep engagement with the Dharma in its different manifestations, this is the kind of state in which we can start to get a deeper contact with the Buddha or, or with, with enlightenment. <clears throat> I want to say a little bit about this because this resonates with my own experience. And um, for quite a long time now, about eight years, I, had a very, I have a very strange habit of meditating in the middle of the night, which actually is a bit of pain. It can be many times in about three or six in the morning. Um, so it's, it's highly inconvenient, but anyway, the, th the, 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 the positive side of this is, is that in the middle of the night when it's really dark, it's really quiet, it's really peaceful, my body's relaxed because I'm lying down in bed, it's actually a brilliant time to meditate, and um, I found I can really engage in meditation at this time. And what also I've noticed is that in this, this time when I'm really engaged with my meditation, um, I get a very strong sense, <clears throat> in fact, it's, it's as if it's an absolute given that one has the capacity to gain enlightenment. I'm not, I'm not in touch with that all the time, but certainly in the middle of the night when I'm meditating in quite an engaged way, I'm, I'm really well in contact with my own potential. I get a strong sense of my own potential for awakening. And this seems to come to me from a deep engagement with meditation practice, which the... Um, the darkness, the quietness, the solitude of the night seems to have forged to me. So this is one way you might talk about coming into deeper relationship with the Buddha or enlightenment is getting a sense of one's own potential. Maybe that's one dimension of coming into a deeper contact with the Buddha or enlightenment.
So now I'd like to just say a few things about some of um, the verses in um, the Dharmapada, which we're, we're, we're focusing on today. And the first one I'd like to focus on is, is in a way, it's sort of a highlight. It, it's the trackless one, which seems to be such a great and mysterious image. It's very evocative while having a kind of a semblance of logic. And to me, it suggests that the, the Buddha follows no path. There's no path laid out for a Buddha once he's become awakened, because he's just spontaneous and responds to the present moment. Um, he doesn't need to have a, a path mapped out for him anymore, because he, he's in touch with reality. Um, and he would teach the Dharma in different ways to different people, depending on who they were, and what their circumstances were. So it seems like there is a path to awakening, but then it sort of peters out um, that once you've attained awakening, there's no really a path um, uh, lined out for uh, once you become awakening. The path leads to awakening, that's all. So if we had taken this, this line rather poetically, um, the trackless one, they seem, to, uh, they seem to suggest to me the image of the bird, because the bird doesn't leave a track. He just flies um, relatively effortlessly through the sky, leaving no track. And this seems to suggest something about the nature of the Buddha being really free. We tend to think, we tend to think of them free as a bird. You know, that's the kind of thing we, we, we might think. So um, the trackless one might suggest the image of the bird and the freedom that, that goes, goes with the bird. And again, th thinking a little bit more fan fancifully, um, if we're thinking of the Buddha acting in accordance with reality, he, he doesn't bump up into reality. He just, he's basically going with it. He doesn't um, disturb things or, or, or creates a track even by, um, by bumping into reality. He's, he's not trying to mold the way things are to his own ends. He's just following that. <clears throat> so it's a bit of a somewhat fanciful way of looking at the verse. But I think we can use our imagination quite effectively when it comes to looking at these somewhat mysterious verses. We shouldn't be too worried about um, being too, uh, too rigorous in a way. It's letting, letting the mind loose. And another, another part of the verse is, is um, the enlightened one whose sphere is endless. So what, what, what might this be talking about? It seems to suggest that um, uh, the Buddha <clears throat> has the whole phenomenal of, of, of existence as his domain. This is the sphere of the Buddha. And the Buddha sometimes talked about as the teacher of gods and men. And if you look at the Pali canon, he's quite often dealing with, with, with gods as well as men. <clears throat> but this verse seems to be suggesting something even more. The whole, the whole, uh, whole sphere of phenomenal existence is, is the domain of the Buddha. And this seemed to bring to mind, to me, um, something we might see on the, the wheel of life, where we've got these different, uh, different realms. We've got the god realm, we've got the animal realm, the human realm, the hungry ghosts, the, <clears throat> the titans and the, um, the hell realms. And if you remember, that each of these realms has a different Buddha in it, or rather a different coloured Buddha, <clears throat> which have, and they have some, they've got something to offer to these um, beings in these different realms. So, for example, in the, the human realm, the, the, the gift to, the, to humans is the holy life, is a symbol of the monk um, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the Wheel of Life uh, depiction. In the, in the animal realm, I seem to remember that, that, that they're given, the animals are given a book, so a symbol of culture. And in the God realm, they're given, um, I think there's a, there's, there's a Buddha playing a lute and he's playing the melody of impermanence. So that's just one way uh, my, my mind went thinking about um, the, who, the Buddha whose sphere is endless. He seems to have all the different realms as his domain. Um, but again, that's a pretty, it's, it's a pretty mysterious thing. What is, that, what is truly being pointed out, I don't know. Uh, maybe this is something which our imagination could, could be let loose on. Then looking at um, another verse, this is 
that whose victory is the Buddha, whose victory is irreversible, and after whose victory no defilements remain to be conquered. <coughs> now it's saying here, <coughs> excuse me, it's being said here that the attainment of nirvana is irreversible. Well, one cannot go back to being unenlightened. Then I seem to remember there's one strange, mysterious case from the Pali Canon where there was one disciple of the Buddha who became enlightened and then lost his enlightenment and then gained it again. So this is, this is um, quite an interesting um, and, and a quite unusual thing. But what it seems to suggest is that, at least to me, that enlightenment isn't quite an attainment in the way that we might normally think of it. It's maybe one way of thinking about it, but it's not quite the full story. So maybe best to take the, the idea of um, nirvana being attained in a, in, in a provisional way, not taking it as the whole story. So if it gives something that can be lost, except admittedly on a very rare occasion, then can it really be thought of truly as an attainment? Now, if we look at later Buddhist tradition, sometimes the uh, nirvana is talked about as being something beyond space and time. It pertains to the dimension beyond space and time, outside space and time. And it's something that is woken up to. And it's sometimes said that um, people who've gained awakening, they realize that they've been enlightened all along. They haven't just woken up to it. They haven't seen this properly before. I think Bhante has said something about this in the past. So it's actually very mysterious. So it's sort of suggesting that, um, again, we can't quite get our heads around enlightenment. We can look at it as some sort of irreversible attainment. We can look at it as something outside of space and time. So these may be different dimensions of looking at enlightenment. But what it is, who knows? You know, these are just possible doorways into it. And then there's the statement about no defilements remaining to be conquered. So this seems to point to there being no greed, hatred or delusion left in an awakened person. All unhelpful habits have been removed and there's full awareness so that they can operate fully on the basis of creativity and loving kindness um, in response to any needs of the current situation. So I'm going to need to start, uh, to wrap up. I'll just say a few more things. And um, in the second verse of this, this chapter, um, it says, that enlightened one in whom there is not that ensnaring, entangling craving to lead anywhere in conditioned existence. So this gives us a bit of a clue as to why um, you can't lead the bullet anywhere in conditioned existence. And that's because craving has been removed. And it's, we can probably look at it substantially as craving, or indeed aversion, as something which leads, leads one down dead ends, uh, which um, there are plenty of in, in the mundane world, which we're probably very used to by now. So finally, one of what I would like to say is, uh, what might it mean um, to come into deeper um, relationship with, with enlightenment or the Buddha? So first of all, we might think uh, we might like to be a bit happier, a bit more fulfilled and a bit more contented. And we might follow the Buddhist path with this in mind. And this is, this is all perfectly fine. Um, however, we may be rather reluctant to commit, commit ourselves fully to the path. After all, enlightenment is a big mystery. I mean, do, do we really want it? It sounds like quite a nice idea, but you know, do, do we really want it? Because it's a bit of a mystery. We might be missing out on something if we became enlightened. At least that's something I think I've been a bit attached to for a while. Um, but if we find we have a genuine aspiration to become enlightened, in spite of it being this big mystery, um, it, mean, it actually means more to us 
than just becoming a bit happier and a bit more contented. And maybe we could say that we've started to come into a, a deeper and more profound relationship with the Buddha and with the awakening. And as I uh, suggested a bit earlier, maybe getting a sense of our own capacity for awakening, particularly at times when we're very engaged with our practice. This could be one way of looking at as us, us coming into a deeper, a more profound relationship with awakening with the Buddha. And also, if we have a, a, some sort of longing for the Buddha, uh, particularly if we start off with um, a sense of his absence in our life, uh, we can get in contact with a sense of longing. And this is a, another way we might come into a deeper uh, relationship with the Buddha, a sense of longing. And then some, some uh, longing for a sight of him is a bit of a quote from one of the uh, Mahayana scriptures. I think that was the Sutra Golden Light, longing for a sight of the Buddha. And um, finally, um, what, to say we when we start out on the on the Buddhist path, the um, the figure of the Buddha is probably a rather a, a remote one, um, it, albeit a, an intriguing one, a figure which might intrigue us deeply. Um, and as we come into deeper relationship with with the Buddha, at some level, he probably still remains something of a, of a remote figure historically, and maybe remote in terms of spiritual stature, particularly from where we are this moment in time. But there are other times, maybe in meditation and in puja, when the Buddha actually seems very close. Or we might even say that um, he's closer than close, the sense um, of us being separate from him, being close or distant from him, seems to go away. So maybe you can even transcend the sense of distance between ourselves and the Buddha. And this can be quite a rich experience. That may be another way in which um, we come into a deeper and more profound relationship with the Buddha. So I've come to the end of um, all I wanted to say. Um, quite a lot of input there, I know. Um, but um, we've now got a little bit of time for a Q&A section. So if there's something you'd like to observe or, or, uh, or questions, um, which I'll do my best to answer. And if, if I can't answer, I'll just ask Vidya Saki what she's going to say about it. She's going to put that down here as well. Um, so if you'd like to put um, some questions in um, the Q&A, then we'll do